Hey guys, welcome back to the Way BK podcast. We've been talking about following the way of Jesus from the book of Mark. So if you got your Bibles, go ahead and open there with us. And uh, we're going to start reading in Mark chapter 2 today, beginning in verse 18. Mark chapter 2, verse 18. John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And they came and said to Jesus, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast? But your disciples do not fast. And Jesus said to them, While the bridegroom is with them, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot fast, can they? So so long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the patch pulls away from it the new from the old, and the, and a worse tear results. No one puts new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is lost, and the skins as well. But one puts new wine into fresh wineskins. So this story um, is the first of a number of stories we're going to see here in the mm-hmm. book of Mark, where uh, Jesus starts to experience some opposition for the work that he is doing. And I just want you to think about as we get going here, um, have you ever gotten in trouble for doing something good? Uh, I think sometimes we're tempted to think, you know, um, if, I do all, if I do what is good and what is right, then the response is always gonna be positive. Um, if, I'm, if I'm doing the right thing, then I should be treated the right way in response. Uh, these stories are gonna show us it doesn't always work like that. Jesus said, "Bless are you whenever they persecute you for righteousness sake. And he said, right. they did this to me. They call me Beelzebul, which we'll see actually later on, even in this uh, very chapter, right. uh, or in chapter 3, excuse me. But uh, if they did that to me, what do you expect them to do to you? I have to say, I think usually the answer for us is like, no. Usually I haven't gotten in trouble for doing good. Usually it's for doing something bad. Right. One of the unique things about Jesus is the only reason he gets in trouble is when he's doing something good. And that's what we're going to see in each of these stories is Jesus getting in trouble for doing good. This first story, he gets in trouble for fasting or for not fasting. Um, John's disciples, the Pharisees are are fasting. Why aren't Jesus' disciples fasting? And uh, Jesus' response, he he responds with a parable. Kind of a strange uh, parable here. He first talks about um, you don't fast at a wedding while the bridegroom is present. Um, but once the bridegroom is taken from them, then it is appropriate uh, to fast. Um, would be a little strange, I think, to hear Jesus say this if you're just like, you know, walking along, all of a sudden he starts talking about a wedding. Like, what does that have to do with uh, not fasting? Right, right. I think, I think this first uh, part of this is uh, Jesus making it clear, hey, this is actually a time for celebration. This is a time for uh, enjoyment. This is a time, this is good stuff. Good stuff is happening right Right. now. And he says there will be a time whenever the bridegroom, speaking of himself, is not going to be there. And that'll be a time to fast, which I think is showing, uh, well, so I think just to back it up a little bit, each of these three that we're going to see, I mean, we kind of saw one controversy already last time with the the issue of whether or not right. Jesus had the right to forgive sins, but that was sort of spirit. That wasn't sort of. It was very spiritual and existential about Jesus. These three controversies that we're going to look at at the end of chapter two and the beginning of chapter three are all debates about how to apply different acts of religious devotion, right. fasting, keeping up the Sabbath for the people under the old covenant, stuff like that. And uh, and Jesus, I think, with all these, is trying to reset them to think, hey, whenever you think about your acts of religious devotion. You need to think about it in the right kind of way. Think about the actual meaning and significance of it. So they were just thinking, and I don't know what all they were thinking. We know from other accounts that the way they thought about their fasting was it's a way to impress other people. Maybe it's a way to uh, earn something from God. Hey, God, look at me. Pay attention. I'm doing this thing. I'm fasting. Or, hey, friends, neighbors, uh, pay attention to me. Look at what I'm doing, that kind of thing. And Jesus says, no, fasting should actually come from um, what's actually going on, what, yeah. the, the need of the moment. He said, right now, this is not a time for fasting. And, of course, we right. know Jesus fasted, and we know his followers fasted That's right. uh, as well. But it wasn't like the disciples of John. It wasn't like the Pharisees who were maybe a lot more rigid about it and a lot more um, oriented toward that activity. Jesus says, now is not a time for that. Now is a time for 
celebration. Now is a time for enjoyment. Now is a time to be with me. It's a time for feasting, not for fasting. Right. And so I think that's what Jesus is doing. He's attacking their view that, um, or trying to reset or recalibrate them to understand that your acts of religious devotion should be expressions of what actually is happening and what's going on inside of you, not some sort of just ritualistic thing or something to just impress people around you. Jesus wasn't interested in that. And that reminds me, I was talking to somebody this week, um, and uh, he had mentioned that he hated fasting. And, and I was asking about it, why, you know? And he mentioned, he said, uh, the reason I hate fasting is um, that one time I fasted and I prayed really earnestly for something, and God didn't give me what didn't I was do it. wanting. Yeah. He did. And, 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 but isn't that the way oftentimes we look at things like this, and I think your point is good. Jesus in this story is trying to help uh, help help them to understand, like, hey, fasting is more is is based on the need of the moment, right. um, and 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 in there's a time when there's a time for feasting, and then there's a time for fasting. This is not the time to fast while Jesus is with them. The time is coming mm -hmm. um, in which they will need to fast when He is taken from them. Um, and with that, Jesus kind of adds this other strange parable talking about unshrunk cloth on an old garment, um, tearing the garment, and, uh, and then old wine being put into, uh, or new wine being put into old wineskins that cause it to burst. Um, kind of strange little parable here, uh, and you may have some, some specific thoughts on it, but it seems to me, if you remember back in chapter 1, uh, they talked about how they were amazed by Jesus' teaching because it was a new teaching yep. with yep. authority. Uh, and it seems like Jesus is reminding them here that it's hard to mix the old with the new. Um, in order for them to be able to receive this new teaching from Jesus, they need new hearts, right. hearts that are able to receive uh, what he's bringing them. And part of that on the practice, I mean, he's addressing their question. Why aren't you like us? Mm -hmm. Why aren't you doing things like we do things? Right. And part of what he's saying is like, no, <laughs> you, you guys are going to have to start over. That's if right. We're gonna, if this thing's going to work, if I'm going to be able to make a difference, otherwise I'm this new, I'm not a new patch, Jesus says. Because right. if you try to treat me like a patch, I've got this little problem in my life. I'm going to take this new garment, I'm going to patch it on my old clothes that are all worn out. It's just going to tear and make it actually even worse. If yeah. you try to come to Jesus and don't actually change, don't actually let him make all things new, and you just say, well, here's my old religious practices. Here's my old ways of thinking. Here's my old sets of ethics. Here's my old beliefs about God. And I like a lot of things about Jesus, so I'm just going to kind of patch him into this hole. I recognize I'm missing something. Or I'm going to pour him into this container, the container of my life. Jesus says it'll blow you up. Right. It'll tear you up. This right. is not going to work. Everything has to start new if you really come to me. So Jesus is basically saying, not only is y'all's question kind of a dumb question about why aren't you fasting? That's the first part. It's like, it doesn't even make sense. I'm here, the bridegroom fasting. Why would we fast right now? But the second thing he says is kind of the question underneath the question, which is, why are you not like us? He says, that's not going to work. You that's will right. be destroyed if you keep that mentality. Whenever you come to Jesus, you got to let go of all your control, all your thoughts about how great your life really is. And you just need a little Jesus to kind of round it out. You gotta let go of all that. Start yeah. fresh. Yeah, and I like that thought because that isn't that often what we want to do. You know, we we just we we don't come to Jesus saying, "Hey, take my life, take my heart, give me a new heart, give me a completely new life." We often come to Jesus to trying to patch a little Jesus onto uh -huh. our old life, uh, just hoping that He'll fix a few things that maybe need some, you know, renovation. Um, and but hoping that we can basically stay the same. Exactly. And I think Jesus is really here trying to open their eyes to recognize that actually. If you're going to follow me, you're going to have to become a completely different person. You're going to have to you're going to have to have a new heart to be able to receive this new teaching that is coming. So uh, that's the first controversy that Jesus experiences in in these in this section today, um, but not the last. Uh, he gets in trouble right after this um, twice for working on the Sabbath. Now, the first time, it's actually not Jesus specifically who they're upset with, but with his disciples. And they're upset with Jesus because he's allowing or permitting his disciples to work on the Sabbath day. Um, now, when we talk about working here, we're not talking about they're out here working 12-hour day in the field. We're talking about they're walking through a field and working by picking heads of grain on the Sabbath. They're criticized for doing what is unlawful. Uh, but in, actual, in actuality, they're not breaking any law of God here. There's no, there, was no God, there was no law of God that said you can't pick grain, uh, heads of grain on the Sabbath. What, 
Because hap- because when we're talking about like this heads of grain, just to be clear, like we're literally talking about they're walking, snapping some stuff off, rolling around their hand, putting it in their mouth. It's the equivalent of opening a bag of chips and putting one in your mouth, right. as opposed to I made Harvesting. you know. <laughs> yeah, like right. I went out and dug some potatoes out of the garden, right. and I washed them and sliced them up and made myself some French fries in the that's air right. fryer. Like that's that's the difference we're talking about. Sorry, go ahead. I cut you off. Well, and that's that's important because it's important for us to recognize here that often what is happening is a mixture of man's traditions right. with God's traditions, yep. and that and that's really important here. Um, you know, you can read today uh, parts of the Talmud and parts of the Jewish rabbinical writings. I mean, there are books. Um, long, huge books. Uh, I got one in my library uh, just on, like a huge volume, just on the laws related to the Sabbath. Yeah. And so what the Jews did is they took the laws that were given in Scripture and they started applying them to every area of life. You know, how many steps can you take on the Sabbath? Uh, how, how much work can you do? At, at what point is it considered What counts work? as work? What doesn't? That's right. And they broke it down um, into every situation and, and area of life. Um, and, uh, and what they're doing, though, is uh, they're mixing together some of their own traditions, some of their own beliefs about how best to, uh, judgments about how best to obey the law of the Sabbath with what God, God had actually said. And so Jesus points them to the purpose behind the Sabbath. In, in verse 25, he's, his response is, have you never read what David did when he was in need and he and his companions became hungry? How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priest. And he also gave it to those who were with him. And Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Verse 28, so the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And I think what Jesus is doing here is he's pointing them to the purpose of behind the Sabbath. Mm-hmm. Sabbath was created for man, not the other way around. And, um, and, 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 and who would know best how to follow God's law? Would it not be the Son of Man, right. who is Lord of the Sabbath? Yeah, which that's the sticking point, right? Like, they don't really think he's the bridegroom. They don't really think he's the Lord of the Sabbath. They think they are. Right. They think they're the ones that are determining what, what, what's going on in human history. They think they're the ones and their traditions and their opinions about things are really the determining factor of what's right or wrong or good or bad or whatever the case may be. I mean, really, what Jesus is saying is, y'all are not the lords of the Sabbath. That's right. I am. And That's you're right. going to have to decide if you're willing to get with that program. And so it's a very similar to the last thing where he's challenging them pretty, pretty straightforwardly about uh, how they were all mixed up. And they were cool with, and I, I'm not sure what all to do with the, the reference to David. It's a little ambiguous to me of exactly what Jesus' point is. But at least part of it would be certainly they were comfortable with David doing something right. as the Lord, as the king, mm-hmm. um, on the, on, on, in regards to the consecrated bread that only the priests were supposed to eat. They were comfortable with that, Jesus is saying. And this is kind of one of many places where Jesus is saying, hey, there's something greater than David here. Yep. And so if you're comfortable with David, you need to understand, like, I actually know what's right and wrong. David didn't even get a revelation or anything like that that permitted him to do this. That's right. And you guys aren't comfortable with me. You need to understand I'm the real one who's the Lord of the Sabbath. But, and I also think there's something important here, too. I mean, Jesus is correcting them and addressing their, um, I mean, if we can say this way, hypocrisy. I think we're going to see hypocrisy in the next story, maybe more explicitly. But definitely their sense of, like, our traditions count as much as God's word. Mm. Jesus says, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath, which is a day on the, on the calendar. But that word Sabbath mean, means rest. And so I think there's also something here, kind of like with the last story. Don't you want to be at the wedding feast? Don't you want to be, have your garment fixed and have a brand new garment? Don't you right. want to have new wine? Don't you want rest? Quit going your way. Quit trying to do it your way. That's right. I'm the master of the Sabbath. He'll say in another place, come to me and I will give you rest. That's right. And so I think this is a great passage to help us see that um, the reason why it's important we don't do things our own way and kind of have our own religious ideas is because we're missing out on what Jesus actually has to offer whenever we do. Which is the heartbreaking part of all this, right? Absolutely. What Jesus is doing here is really exposing them. They had no issue with David breaking the law um and he clearly broke the law of god mm-hmm. um but uh but but they're attacking jesus here and, and and really it's exposing them you know jesus will talk about in another uh, in, in in another uh story um you know when you're when your ox falls in the ditch on the sabbath don't right. you pull him out right like 
it's really not about what they say this is about. Yeah. It's really about their issues with Jesus as a person. Isn't that um, isn't that the way it often works? You know, um, we start to see something we don't like or somebody we don't like. We start to pick at whatever we can find, and you're seeing that here. Uh, I think you see that even more in chapter three, verses yep. one to six, because. Um, the second time that Jesus gets attacked for stuff related to the Sabbath, it's Jesus himself who gets charged with working on the Sabbath. So just to set the stage, we're in the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and there's a man there who has a withered hand. Um, so they're watching. All right, get this. They're watching to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. Can you imagine this? Can you imagine coming to a worship service, but your reason for coming to worship um, is not to praise God and give him the glory that he deserved, but to watch and see right. what this person will do so that we can find some reason to accuse uh, that person. It's um, a stakeout. I mean, it's like all the movies where you have like FBI agents sitting in the car outside somebody's house they're pretty sure is a criminal. Right. They're just watching, waiting for them to do something bad. That's how That's these right. people are dealing with Jesus. So... What is Jesus going to do about it? Um, you know, the thing I love about Jesus, he does not allow opposition, rejection, or, um, or just uh, people who are, 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 are looking to accuse him. Danger. Yeah. He does not allow danger to keep him from doing what he believes is right yep. to do yep. and what he knows is right to do. And so in, in this story, in spite of the fact that they're looking for a reason to accuse him, Jesus does the very thing mm -hmm. that they were uh, were hoping that he would do. Yeah. Um, he heals the man. Right. Um, now, ironically, it's get, this is pretty cool to me. Um, what did what work did Jesus do to actually heal the right. guy? Um, not really anything. Like stretch nothing. out your hand, bam, there it is. It's doesn't, done. It, Jesus doesn't stand up. Jesus doesn't touch him. Jesus does nothing except speak. The very thing that they themselves would have to do if they were going to accuse him of doing something wrong, they'd have to do so verbally. Right. Jesus heals him in the one way that nobody could actually accuse of, of being work. So while they're trying to accuse him, Jesus is still using the moment, yep. and I love this, to actually teach some really important things about him. What do you see in this story? What should we take away? What is Jesus trying to teach us through this action on the Sabbath? It seems to me, verse 4, his, his question, which should seem so obvious and rhetorical, mm. but clearly wasn't something that, well, it's something that they wouldn't have disagreed with um, theoretically, right. but practically they were disagreeing with That's it. That's right. Verse 4, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath or to do evil, to save life or to kill? And this is, of course, coming right on the heels of the, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And they knew all the Sabbath laws, whenever you go back and read them, uh, don't make your servants work on the Sabbath. Don't even make your animals work. You're supposed to give them rest on that day. You shouldn't work, all that kind of stuff. Uh, Jesus' question is, are you guys cool with good being done? Are you guys cool with lives being saved? And the truth is they weren't. Mm -hmm. They weren't. Because the good that Jesus was doing was taking away their power. It was taking <laughs> away their prominence. It was taking away the image they had in people's eyes. That's right. Um, and so they really weren't comfortable with good being done on the Sabbath if it was something that would uh, diminish them. That's or right. bring them low, or humble them, or whatever the case may be. And I think that's why in verse 5 it says, After looking around at them with anger, being grieved at their hardness of heart, he then does this. I think that's something, by the way, I, to my knowledge, I know there's some other stories where Jesus behaves pretty strongly toward people, and I think it would be fair for us to say he behaved uh, with a righteous, uh, divine anger. As far as I know, this is the only time in Scripture where it explicitly says Jesus, while he was in the flesh, was angry. I may be forgetting one, mm. but as far as I know, that's the only time. There may be it may be in Mark eleven with the fig tree, but I don't even think that one it says mm. it. And my point is not like getting nitpicky about that. I'm not saying it's the only time Jesus felt divine anger, but it's noteworthy that he's so upset, so deeply disturbed and grieved over the fact that people so can't let go of their own power and trust in him and humble themselves before him that they want this man to stay messed up, whatever right. the shriveled hand, right. whatever deformity or disability this man had. They wanted this man to stay in that condition because they couldn't let go of their own power, greatness, right. image, whatever the case may be, and to honor what Jesus is doing as the Son of Man, as the Son of God, as the one who has the right to forgive sins and who's the Lord of the Sabbath and all this kind of stuff. They're looking for a way to mess him up and mess up his project 
of doing good and saving lives because of what it would cost them. Well, and that, I think you hit it. Like that That's what's behind all this. For all the emphasis on being religious, for all the dedication that they're giving to the law, law of God, for all the focus on, uh, on all these, these spiritual things, they were not in it for the glory of God. Right. They were not in it for the good of mankind. Exactly. I mean, and this story, this story completely exposes it because uh, while they're over here accusing Jesus of not using the Sabbath um, in a way that is lawful, um, they're accusing him of working on the Sabbath when he's working to do good. Right. If you want to call it work, if you he's want to doing, work, right? He's doing good. Yeah. Uh, they leave here and they go right out and they start conspiring with the Herodians as to how they might destroy him. So while Jesus is working on the Sabbath to do good, they are working on the Sabbath to do evil. Yeah. And doesn't that really just expose what they're interested in is not the glory of God, but their own glory. Jesus came to heal. Jesus came to give rest. What greater fulfillment of the Sabbath is there than giving someone rest on the Sabbath? Um, this is this is Jesus showing what the purpose of the Sabbath is, how the how the Sabbath would ultimately be fulfilled. But they can't see that because they're so consumed with their own um, selfish, fleshly, prideful desires. And this is sobering to me, yeah, I think, God help and, me. And, and, and scary as we read this because you, in, at this time we see Jesus becoming more and more popular with the ordinary people of this day, but he's also creating more and more enemies with the most religious people of his day. Um, and in fact, we're going to see in chapter 3, and verse 20 and 21, that even his family comes after him. Uh, and, and, and I think this is maybe a good time to say this, um, that the, the real lesson to take away from this is uh, if we do good and if we do the work of God, we should expect to get into what somebody said called good trouble. Mm -hmm. um, getting into good trouble uh, it, it, it is not a sign that we are displeasing the Lord. Actually, it's a sign of righteousness. And, and this is so important because I think sometimes we're tempted to think, you know, if, if, if I do good, um, it'll be thought as good. But, but truthfully, Satan is, is crafty. He knows how to get us. Um, and he's good at convincing people that evil is good and that good is evil. Right. Yeah, and I, and I think it's striking that these stories show Jesus going through that. And it's interesting how the disciples are there for all of them. Even right. going back to the beginning of chapter 2, whenever, um, or a little earlier, whenever they go to the house of, uh, of Levi, the tax collector, and, and actually these uh, folks who didn't like Jesus, they come to the disciples and say, hey, why does your teacher do such and such? And mm -hmm. the disciples don't give an answer. I don't know if that's because Jesus didn't give them a chance to, or mm -hmm. if they were kind of like, I don't know, man, I don't really want to be here anyways. I don't like this either. <laughs> like, I'm with you guys. I don't know what the reason was. But, but then with the rest of these, it's the disciples. Uh, well, they're being, why aren't your disciples fasting? And they're just kind of there. They're not giving an answer. And then you've got uh, the disciples, the one plucking the heads of grain. You can also imagine them like about to eat. And the fairies, oh, why are they doing it? Right. And then they're like, oh. And then Jesus like, oh, okay. And they go ahead and eat. And then this one where they're uh, in the synagogue, presumably they're present with Jesus whenever that occurs also. So with all these stories, you've got the disciples kind of in the backdrop. Right. But the interesting thing is next, the next kind of part of the story is Jesus calls his apostles 12 among the disciples, 12 apostles in verse uh, 13 or verse 14. Yep. It said, or verse 13, Jesus went up the mountain and summoned those who he wanted and they came to him. He appointed 12 whom he also named apostles to be with him, to send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. Basically to be little photocopies of himself, not the real thing, but to basically do and say the same kinds of things he was doing and saying. Right. And I think that's noteworthy because, to your point, it's not just that Jesus got himself into trouble for doing good. That's his expectation. I mean, yeah. once again, whenever he, uh, in another place where this, this uh, instance is recorded, he actually tells his disciples, his apostles whom he sends out, explicitly, hey, remember what they called me? Yeah. They're going to call you the same thing. Yeah. Remember how they treated me? They're going to treat you the same way. This is just part of the program. And God's been rejected throughout history. Jesus is rejected. And those who follow him and who do the same kinds of good deeds he did, are going to experience the same thing. And yeah. that's, not a, that's not a sign that something's gone wrong or that it's bad, and it shouldn't be something that causes fear or holds us back from doing good. It's, it's got to just be something we understand and embrace that this is part of the deal. 
Yeah, and I'm thinking there's there's two things that stand out to me about that. One is um, it's pretty cool that Jesus can take people from all different walks of life from all different backgrounds. Right. None of these guys seem to have like the impressive credentials you'd be expecting in a kingdom, you no. know, that's being built. They have things uh, that would go against them. Right, right, yeah. right. Um, but Jesus can take them and use them for his glory. Right. Also gets me though, the last person that's mentioned in this list who Jesus chooses, Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Yeah. Even walking with Jesus, following Jesus for three years, does not protect someone from the evil that can creep into our hearts yeah. if we are not watching that. Which I guess kind of to bring this home um, as kind of a, a take home for us today, um, I think these stories should sober us and, 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 and provide a real warning for us. Um, they show us how easy it is to become hypocritical. Yep. In spite of the fact that these people were super religious, super diligent about reading their Bibles, uh, super diligent about going to worship each week and, and following all these, observing all these laws, um, you know, they're devoted law students, they're teachers of the word, and yet blatantly hypocritical in their attacks against Jesus. And, uh, and this just made me think about the fact that pride can blind us from the ability to see ourselves as we really are. Right. So I guess the question maybe to throw out and talk about for a few minutes before we wrap up is um, how, how do we um, attack pride and avoid becoming uh, religious hypocrites in our service to God? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's humongous, I think, and, and read through almost all the scriptures that hits it. But there are a few things in these stories that I think help us. For one, uh, I'm thinking about the first story. Hmm. Do I assume that what I, or maybe the first two stories, do I assume that what I do and what I believe is correct? Mm. Now, I should be convicted. Right. I, I, should, I should believe what I believe. I should be convicted about that. I should even, I mean, the scriptures even teach, I should seek to persuade others to That's believe right. that, right? But the reason I should be convicted about it is not because it's what I do or what we do or what I believe or what we believe. I should be convicted about it because it's what the Lord has said. Right. Their problem was they had come to some agreements. This is how we're going to, to your point earlier, uh, not just, oh, this is what the Bible says or this is what God says, but this is our understanding of what God says or this is how we apply what God says. Therefore, it must be true. It must be right Yeah. because we do it. That was the question. The question was not, why do your disciples not fast as would please God? Right. Their question was, why do your disciples not fast like us? Right. Why are you not like us? So one way that I can at least diagnose whether I'm prideful and one way that if I would remove this mentality, I could attack it is don't make judgments based on what I'm already doing or what I think. I shouldn't be saying, why are you not like us? I should be asking if what I'm actually doing is biblical and godly and right in God's eyes. I should be asking, hey, why are you not doing this thing that God said? Because that, by the way, opens me up to the possibility of the person saying, Actually, it is what God said. And, then I'm, and because I'm not prideful because of my way, I'm trying to protect my tribal beliefs or whatever, I say, oh, really? I didn't know that. Let's talk about it. Let's look at it. I'm not going to be prideful then. I'm going to be convicted, yeah. and I'm going to be diligent and religious in what I'm doing. But it's not going to be about me, and it's not going to be about convincing you. you got to agree with me. because I, I think that's one, in the first story at least, to me that's one way we can attack pride and pursue humility is to not think in terms of why are you not like us? but to rather think what would be pleasing to God. Hey, brother, hey, sister, why don't we come over here and please God and, and, uh, and that sort of thing. Yeah, and to that point, one, one, one real test of whether or not I'm, I'm being prideful or I'm being humble is how do I respond when confronted by somebody who, 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 who opens my eyes to help yeah. me see right. that actually maybe what I thought was right is actually not what God wants and what is pleasing. Um, and you see in this uh, again and again, they respond um, defensively, mm -hmm. um, accusatorily, if that's a word. Um, they, they, They're on the with attack, attack even. Yeah, yeah. With, atta with attacks against the person. And sometimes, uh, I think this is important for us, so sometimes we may be confronted with something. Somebody says, yes, this is not actually you know, in accordance with the will of God. This is not actually what God said. This is not actually what God wants. Um, we need to be open humble enough to at least consider the possibility that we may be wrong, right. that there may be more for me to see about the will of God um, yeah. in, in his word. Yeah. I'm um, going to throw another one out as far as um, 
one manifestation of their pride was, I guess it's, it's kind of two things, but it's in the story with the man with the withered hand. On the one hand, they, uh, they were not really interested in helping someone else. Like, right. They saw this man with the withered hand as a prop for their purposes. Right. You know, we're going right. to use this guy. They're not concerned about helping him out. They're not concerned about any good being done for him. They get so upset that he, after he gets helped, instead of rejoicing, being in awe, being amazed, it's like it doesn't even register with them that someone's life was just changed. Right. All right, so maybe here's another question for me. Am I giving into just religious hypocrisy and pride, or am I really being a humble seeker of God? The person who's hypocritical in their religious practices really doesn't care about the good of other people. Right. I only see other people as a prop for my own prominence or my own uh, self-satisfaction or my own image. By the way, I might say sometimes people help others as a prop. That's Jesus right. attacked the same group of people out. They would give to the poor sometimes, That's but right. they would do it and make sure everybody, oh, hey, y'all look, hey, come over. And they're, and they're using even their acts of service. So it's not just even that you're actively trying to harm somebody like they're trying to do here. But just when you view other people not as uh, someone to love and someone to help and someone to serve, but you view them as a tool right. for your own uh, purposes. In a similar but maybe kind of uh, different side of the coin as far as using other people, they run out and they align with the Herodians. which would it, I, I think for us it's like, okay, another group of ancient Jewish people that I'm not familiar with. For the people of the day, though, that would be a shocker. The Pharisees and the Herodians were diametrically opposed to each other. Mm-hmm. They, I mean, the Herodians were... Uh, involved in a lot of immoral activities. You can read about them in the, in the New Testament. Things that the Pharisees, at least on the surface, have been like, oh, we're not, we don't do that kind of stuff. We don't associate with that kind of dirty, sinful, rotten, evil stuff. Right. But they were willing to align themselves with evil people, people that they should have been convicting and preaching to and trying to bring out. But because we've got this end that we want to achieve, right. we're willing to align ourselves with these people. Well, once again, you're using people as a prop, as a tool. I'm willing to use this uh, man with a withered hand to accomplish my goal of, of right. attacking Jesus. And if that doesn't work, I'll go to the bad guys, to the Herodians, and I'll use them to attack Jesus. But you just view people as tools and props instead of people to care about and love and help and serve. And I think that's a, that's a good test. Yeah, because ultimately it's not about the glory of God. It's about the glory of me. Yeah. You know? and, and, and again, we need the spirit of John the Baptist who says that I must decrease so sure. that he can increase. In, in, in this case, I think what we're seeing again and again is people who are in it for their own glory. They're in it for their own name, their own fame, their own uh, importance. And now that that's being threatened, it causes everything uh, in their lives to fall apart. I'll give you one, one more here um, just to watch out for. If I'm constantly looking at the sins and the flaws in others right. and ignoring the much greater sins and flaws in my own heart. Yep. Um, you guys know the text that uh, you know the saying of Jesus. You know how can you um, take the speck, remove the speck out of your brother's eye if you got a log in your own eye? But isn't that what we're often doing? We're yes. often using the Word of God and, and think about how how tempting it is to read a passage of Scripture and be like, oh, or, or to hear a sermon preached and be like, oh, I hope brother so and so was listening to that. I hope sister so and so heard that. You know, I, I hope my mom. You know, I hope my my, my wife. My unchristian it. neighbor. They yeah. needed to hear that. Lesson. Yeah, yeah. And we end up thinking about uh, what the word means for somebody else and what's wrong with somebody else, and ignoring the things that are actually going on within our own hearts. Um, we need to watch out for this. Whenever I hear the word of God, whenever I'm looking into the perfect law of liberty and studying it, my first thought should be, what does this mean for me? Mm-hmm. And what are the, what's the log that's in my own eye? Maybe, maybe truthfully, the piece of wood in this guy's eye over there is bigger than the one in my own, but it shouldn't look that way to me. Right. It should always look like to me, whatever issue is in me is a much bigger deal. Uh, and I think they're, they're constant issue. I mean, how could you go from you know, criticizing somebody for doing good on the Sabbath to going and doing evil on the Sabbath. Well, you do it because you're not thinking about, hey, what does the Word of God mean for me and how do I need to grow and change? Mm-hmm. Um, but rather you're thinking about um, how can this benefit me? How can I, you know, how can I use uh, and, and keep uh, and steal this glory that should be going to God for myself? Yeah, yeah. I'll throw in one more before, before you kind of bring us home, but... Uh... 
you know, the list of the 12 apostles, once again, for us, it's just kind of a list of names. And it's an important list of names. I mean, mm-hmm. it's in the Gospels. It's in the Book of Acts. These men were very important and integral to God's plan. Uh, but as you kind of alluded to earlier, these were not impressive kind of people. And not only were they not impressive, but a lot of them probably wouldn't have enjoyed being with each other very much, at least apart from their association with Jesus. you got regular old day labor fishermen, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Even among that, you got Peter, who never can keep his mouth shut, ever. Right. You got James and John, who in Luke chapter 9, well, Jesus nicknames them uh, sons of thunder, right. which is identified here in this text. And in Luke chapter 9, you get a story that kind of illustrates why. Because some people rejected Jesus, and their solution was, well, you want us to call down fire and burn the town down? That's the way <laughs> they think about it. What would it be like working with some people like that? That that's their instant reaction when anything goes wrong. Then you got somebody like Thomas, who every story about Thomas He's going to find the most negative angle that you can find on any situation. Mm. How would that be to, to be with somebody like that, to be associated with somebody like that all the time? You've got Simon the Zealot. Uh, the Zealots were a political, radical political group that were fighting against the Roman government. And then you've got M- Levi, Matthew, the tax collector, who was literally on the payroll for the Roman government. What was it like for those two dudes whenever they sat down for their first team meeting with Jesus? I mean, this is like, this is not. But I think there's something important here that one of the ways our pride gets addressed is whenever we're uh, working with other people that uh, that are pretty different from us and maybe in some ways we may not think very highly of. No doubt uh, Levi wouldn't have thought very highly of Simon Mm -hmm. due to their political differences and vice versa, maybe more strongly Simon to Matthew, I don't know. Mm No doubt, um, you know, Matthew has a good government job. I don't know what, what his status was, but he's working for the government. And from our accounts we see in the Gospels, tax collectors seem to be doing okay. He's working with day laborers that smell like fish because of their jobs, you know. you got all these different kinds of people, all of whom might have looked at each other kind of sideways apart from Jesus. But one of the ways we cultivate greater humility, like I said in uh, Romans 12, I forget, it's around verse 18, I think, but if we associate with the lowly. That's right. And, and not thinking, oh, we're the, we're the best people and I'm going to be with the best people and the smartest people and all that. But we actually put ourselves in alignment and harmony with people, just like Jesus did. The people that Jesus was with were the people who were sick, who were hungry, who were demon-possessed, who were confused, who acknowledged that they didn't know the will of God and they were seeking it from Him. That's who Jesus was with. And if we're going to really learn to follow the way of Jesus, we've got to humble ourselves with each other and with all people, not associating with the high things, but associating with the lowly. And, and, and really, that's a great thought to end on. Um, we're, we're doing this podcast because we're trying to bring the Word of God to more and more people. But really what we want, our deep desire, is, is that more and more people would come to follow in the way of Jesus. As we read through the Gospel, as we read through the New Testament, it's clear that the people of God did not do that all by themselves. Right. And I am not, the heart is deceitful, um, and I am not fit to overcome pride and to attack pride all by myself. I need the help of others who are following in the way of Jesus as well. And so if you're listening to this and you're not connected to, uh, to a group of, di- of disciples who are following in the way of Jesus, uh, reach out to us. Let us know how we can help you um, to get connected with, with some disciples who can, who can help you toward that end. Thanks so much for listening. May the Lord bless you all. May the Lord help us. This is our prayer that we would every day follow in the way of Jesus. Amen.